right? All right, so <clears throat> victorious prayer. So we split this last verse of Matthew chapter 6. There we go. Just waiting for my phone to catch up. It takes a little bit. We are um, finishing up Matthew chapter 6. So, so far as we have went through um, the, the, the model prayer, Jesus was teaching. The disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray. So he began to teach them. He says, we start off with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We talked about how prayer is to be relational. Our Father who art in heaven. And I love the hallowed be his name. I always think, you know, if you don't respect his name, then don't ask for his fame. You know, I'm a poet and didn't know it. So, uh, you know, so our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We need to be kingdom-minded in our prayer. It's not about me. It's not about my kingdom. It's about God's kingdom. So what I should be in my prayer life, I should be seeking the will of God. God, what is your will for this situation? What are you wanting to do? We then talk about our daily bread. A lot of times we don't know the difference between when needs and wants. A lot of times we get so focused on tomorrow that we're not even living in the day. So then we talked about forgiving others or forgive my, forgive my sins as I forgive those who've sinned against me. A lot of times we, we really focus in our lives that, God, I want you to forgive me, but I'm not willing to forgive others. It doesn't work that way. That's why in this prayer... Jesus is, I mean, when you start looking at this, he could have talked about a lot of different things, couldn't he? He's teaching them, this is how you are to pray. Jesus is teaching how to pray. And one major aspect on that is that if you want to be forgiven, you better start forgiving. Hmm, that's tough. That's tough. Then we, last week, we began this last line as lead us not into temptation. We talked about temptation, so we're, we're, we broke this into two parts. It's all about being victorious in prayer having victorious prayer and then today we're looking at that but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen right this is good so guys what I want to share with you as we prepare to go into this um, I really want to kind of talk about um, you know it's kind of interesting that this kind of lands on the pastor appreciation day but in first Peter chapter 5 it says this to the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder in, in the King James, it says shepherd. So uh, to, to the shepherds among you, I appeal as a fellow shepherd. It's the same Greek word. You can put either words in there. And I witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. Why I put this passage up here for us is this, is that we're talking today about defeating the evil one. We're talking about a battle that's happening in your life. One of the things that as I was preparing for this message, one of the things that kept coming to my mind and, and my heart was, as a shepherd of a church, and, and ask shepherds, you can ask any of the pastors that are here, we see things in the flock that the flock doesn't often see. I don't know why. But there's so many times you can see things, you can see what the enemy is doing and how he messes with people and they don't recognize him messing with them. The hardest part, I think, one of the hardest parts about being a pastor is when it comes to this spiritual warfare aspect because we see it happening we see it happening sometimes I see it happening in your life and I try to warn you or one of them try to warn you and say hey this is happening and then it just seems like it threw gasoline on a fire that was already there right let me give you an example that's not people related um, I'm also I'm like a glutton for punishment I guess because I also have sheep at the at the house and, and, and so as a shepherd of those sheep, when I'm out there and I see them limping or some one of them's injured or some of them's hurt, um, you've you got to bring them in. You bring them into the pen so that you can work them. And I'll tell you what, the moment that you go, you know, hey, I want to help. I'm going to trim your hoof. I'm going to make your foot feel better. And it will kick and scratch. I mean, you guys back, you know, go through my post a while back, but um, I had a fight with a sheep and, and lost within the first 15 seconds. 
and I had scratches all over my body. We both fell. It fell out of the chute, and I was holding on to the side, and then we're looking at each other, and it was like, <laughs> like that, and I was like, ah, like that, and I lost really fast. I had scratches all over my body. I'm like, really? Are you serious that a sheep can do this? Was, I'm glad it wasn't a cow, you know, so, you know, that wasn't real serious, you know, but uh, sheep are serious. I'm telling you what, that sheep farm, you got to watch out, you know, that's crazy, uh, dangerous, I guess. So I never thought that, but they don't want to be worked on, even when they need worked. It's like us, though. It's, we're the same. That's why God calls us sheep, is we're kind of stubborn like those animals. We don't want what we need. How often it's like, you need this. I don't want it. And we'll fight. And we'll fight to not get what God actually has for us. And so one of the hardest things about being a pastor is that exact thing. And sometimes you're like, I can see what's happening in your life. You can't see it. But we've turned off our ears and our sight to what God has for us. Let me give you an example, another one. A year ago, a little over a year ago, we studied the bait of Satan. And it talked about how the devil sets a trap for you, and inside that trap, it's a fence. The, the bait is a fence, being offended. And what he really wants to do is, see, the devil loves setting traps. He doesn't actually want you to know that he's setting a trap. He wants to stay in the shadows so that you think your problem is with people. He wants you to think that all of your, your anger, your frustrations, all of your pains have to do with flesh and blood. But we already know that God's word says the battle is not against flesh and blood. But the devil loves to make it about that because then you will fight. He'll put the sword in your hand and have you kill each other just to stay out of it. And so what he likes to do is set these traps all over the place. And he's just like, you know what? That person said this thing and I'm going to put a fence right here. I want you to take that bait. And you know what was so amazing? Didn't we recognize how many times during that teaching everybody got offended? It was crazy. You start teaching, hey guys, don't get offended. And everybody's offended. Are you kidding? Open up the two ears you got and use them. I couldn't believe how many people got offended during the teaching on not taking offense. I heard a great line yesterday. You're a Christian. Get over it. Man, and so then all of a sudden I'm like, well, Lord, you're laying on our heart to go through this study of don't give the enemy a seat at your table. And you know what's amazing is the moment you start teaching on that, you start seeing, hey, you're letting the wrong person sit at your table right now. You're listening to the wrong voice right now. Don't we? It's a crazy, and then all, so, so you, as a pastor, we, it's like, man, come on, get this. Don't let him sit down. Don't give them an inch. Don't give them your ear. Stop listening to them. But what was super awesome this last Wednesday, this last Wednesday, um, several ladies grabbed me in the hallway and they're like, you know what, Pastor? Man, this has been so great because we didn't realize how much we were letting the devil sit at our table. And I'm like, yes, we're getting it. Because it's not about you going like, hey, you're letting... Every one of us has let the devil sit at our table. Every single one of us have let him sit there and tell us how worthless we are. We've sat him, let him sit at our table and tell, him how, tell us how worthless other people are. We've allowed him to do all kinds of things in that conversation. We've all done it. I've done it. You've done it. And the point of this teaching is to get to a point where I recognize it so I can stop it. It's not a matter of whether you're doing it or not. We're all doing it. We all let them take a seat. And it happens so quick. By the way, it's not too late to come to that class. Never. We're only like two weeks into it, so we're doing all right. So today, before we get into the actual teaching that I really want to do, I want to share some of the things that we've actually learned from that class so that I can catch all of you guys up that haven't come yet. See what I just did there? Pretty smooth, pretty smooth right there. So um, I want to actually share with you some of the tactics that he does. Some of these tactics are from the teaching, and some of these I added a few extra ones, but I'm just going to share with you kind of seven quick little tactics that what the devil tries to do. So um, 
so that if you're taking notes, I actually numbered them one through seven. This is not actually the main part of the teaching today, but this is something I think that how can I fight him if I don't know what he's trying to do? So number one, the, the devil masquerades. He loves to masquerade as an angel of light. You can find the passages. They're all there. You see, here's the deal. That... What he really would love to do in your life, because remember that he loves to work from the shadows. He does not, the devil doesn't typically love to take a direct approach to, to you. He really likes to attack from behind. He likes to set traps and snares. He just doesn't want you to know it's him. So he loves to act as if he's an angel of light. What this means is this, that he will sit there and he's going he's gonna to speak to you in such a way that you're feeling like you're hearing words of God. You see, we always picture the little angel, white angel on one side and the red devil with a pitchfork on the other side. I'm telling you, that's not how it is. The devil can offer you a job. He can offer you a job that gives you more money. Or he can give you a raise. The devil can can offer you all kinds of things. And so often we miss that. We think, oh, hey, I have a job offer. That must be God. Use wisdom. Not everything that's offered to you is from God. Don't you dare forget that the devil loves to pretend that he's good. He wants to pretend that he's an angel of light because he wants to lead you into the darkness. And we're led into the darkness without even thinking about it. He can give you advice that sounds really good. He will deceive you. In Genesis chapter 3, what a story between the serpent and Eve and how he twisted the scripture how he twisted God's intentions how he twisted the word the devil loves to add to the word and take away from the word because you don't know it well enough to know that he did it think about this the devil has been around scripture longer than we've been alive and you forget that he's smart the devil's not dumb he studies The scripture so he can twist it and manipulate it and he studies you to figure out where you're weak. I had somebody once say, well, you know, he was praying about what to do in his life and he said, you know what I did? I just took my Bible and I just let it fall open and I just pointed to a spot. And whatever I pointed to, I was going to do. Did you ever think, what if you pointed at the part where it said, sacrifice your son? What if you landed in there? What he actually landed in was pretty close. It was Abraham packing up everything he had and he moved. And you know what this guy did? Packed up everything he had and moved. He got there and packed everything up and moved back. (laughs) You see, what I'm wanting you to understand is that the, the devil will manipulate and use Scripture to try to get you to do anything you can do to get off track. That's his goal. He's like, I just don't, he doesn't care that you're, he doesn't, the devil doesn't always want you just to do bad stuff. He just doesn't want you to follow God's plan for your life. So he's okay with you going to church. He's okay with you you moving. He's okay with it. As long as you're not where God wants you to be, he's okay. See, a lot of times we think that the devil's only there to try to get us to sin. No, he just wants to keep you distracted. We're going to get into a couple more here in a little bit. And he will also, number three, he'll pretend to be sympathetic to you. This came from our study this last week, and I was like, wow. You know, the, Louis Giglio is, is the one who wrote this book and did the teaching, and I thought it was so amazing as he gave an illustration. He talks about how God prepares for a table. It's out of Psalm 23. God prepares this beautiful table for us, right? And he's sitting down, and he's inviting us to sit down with him. And so, but he says, you know, what's amazing is we're standing there and we're, we kind of sit down and all of a sudden we don't realize how quickly the devil sits down and just makes himself at home at this table. And he's like, well, so ha- how's your job doing? Is your boss still a jerk? Oh, yeah? I, I can't believe you're still there. Oh, hey, how, how's, your, how's, your, how's your wife doing? You know, I mean, is she still always nagging you on that thing, you know? Man, I can't believe that you stuck with her. I'm, I, you, you got more patience than I do. And what he does is he sits down, and it's not like he cares about your wife. He doesn't care about your job. What he's just trying to do is to get you to have a conversation and dwell on the negativity that's in your life. Every one of us has negativity in our life. 
There's negative stuff going on all of our lives, and the devil wants you to focus on that. So he'll sit down at that table and he'll start a good conversation and you think, wow, he cares. He doesn't care about you. So all this whole time you're like having a conversation with you, but then you you don't realize this conversation isn't glorifying God at all. Talking bad about my boss, talking bad about my spouse, talking bad about my kids, talking bad about their, you know, friends. I'm talking bad about this. I'm talking, and all of a sudden you're having, he's just, he's just keeping you going. He's just stirring the pot. Fourth thing, and let me, let me say this, the, uh, the passage that I use there is when he pretends to be empathetic, I use Genesis 3 again, when he actually pretends to be on Eve's side, God knows that if you eat this fruit, then you'll be like him. See, he's pretending to be on her side, oh, God's leaving you out of some of this stuff, but God, you know, God's kind of, he's the bad guy, and here's what, you know, here, he, God knows if you do this, that, so he's trying to pretend to be on her side. Man, if you eat this, you're going to be just like God. God doesn't want you to eat that and be like Him. The number four, He is the father of lies. Oh, this is the one, Pastor Paul, Mike, I, I find this one the most frustrating as a pastor. Someone will know the truth, right? I know the truth. And the truth sets us free, John 8, 32. But I'll stand on the lie instead. Let me give you a great example. This is the one that I think the devil has such a stronghold in our minds. I'm not good enough. I would normally at this point ask how many of you are struggling with that, but then I just said I can't stand this one, and I don't want you to think that I can't stand you. That would be another lie that would start a whole other problem that, that doesn't need to happen at all. But here's the thing is that we know the truth. The truth says this. In, in Psalm 139, it says that God knew us before we were formed. That, that in my mother's womb, he knit you together. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 14, then it talks about how his works are marvelous. You see, here's the deal, guys. God doesn't make junk. He created you, formed you in your mother's womb, so he's the creator. He doesn't make mistakes. You're not a mistake. When the moment that we say, I'm not good enough, what you're really saying is, God, you're not good enough because you made me. But none of us would dare say that, but we will sure say that we're not good enough. That's a lie from hell. Why are we living in it? You see, you know the truth. God doesn't make junk. God made me. I'm not junk. Period. You stand on that that truth. You see, what happens is that we know the truth and then he'll, the, the devil will, you're just, see, 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 you made a mistake. You're not good enough. See, and then we're like, yeah, I'm just, and then we'll just dive right into the devil's pond. Just like that. I made a mistake and now we're all of a sudden not good enough again. You see, that's the devil's tactic in your life. He knows that if I can get you to buy into a lie, I'll destroy you. And he destroys us over and over and over and over again. Because we let his lies remain in our hearts and in our minds. Number five, he will use any natural desire against you. In 1 John chapter 2, it says that, that our sinful nature involves these three areas the, the lust of the flesh, okay? This could be like addictions, you know? Food addictions, drug addictions, alcohol addictions, phone addictions, right? Social media addictions. Oh, I'm meddling. That's all right. I'm, you have to appreciate me today, so I'm really going to go. So, <laughs> remember, you have to appreciate me when you walk out. Okay, so... Um, so, so, so the, the lust of the flesh, the things that my, my body desires, the lust of the eyes, this is where a lot of the sexual immorality comes in, pornography, um, lusting after, coveting what other people have, I want what they have, mine's not good enough, um, lusting and, and coveting, and greed, all of this lust of the eyes, and then pride of life. Tell you what, pride gets us, doesn't it? Pride gets us to not ask for help when we ask it. Pride says I'm right and everyone else is wrong. 
Pride does all kinds of things. Pride makes us stubborn as mules. Number six, he will keep you busy. Oh, he'll keep you busy. I think I was supposed to put from God, keep you too busy. No, yeah, that's right. He will keep you too busy for God. So here's the thing. I talk to people all the time. Hey, where are you at? You may have gotten one of these messages. Hey, miss you at church. Hope you're doing okay. How are you, right? But here's the thing. How many times I, the number one answer ever given is, man, things are busy right now. Life is just crazy. I want you to understand that this is a tactic. I'm not saying because you miss one week. I'm talking about when we start missing and missing and missing and missing. And then before long, we're not going to Wednesday nights either. We're not going to Sunday school either. And before long, because the devil doesn't care. He doesn't have to get you to sin. All he needs to do is keep you so busy, you don't have time for God, who's supposed to be number one in your life. Seek ye first. Seek ye first. What is it? First. Seek ye I, uh, come on, seek ye. I want to hear like there's 250 people in this room. Seek ye the kingdom of God. Are we? It seems like, and it kind of ties in with the next one. We get our priorities messed up pretty quickly. God becomes number two, then he becomes number three, and then he becomes number four. And then he just, hey, God, you're in the top five. You should be happy about that. I'm telling you, parents, listen to me. If you have kids in this room, parents, if your priorities are jacked up and God is not number one in your life, don't ever expect God to be number one in your kid's life. And they know it. Just because you go to a Sunday worship service does not mean that your priority is God. Do your kids see you studying and praying? Do they see your life changing and getting closer to God? Or are you just going through the motions? See, what I'm wanting you to understand, and this isn't to attack us. This is to help us see that the devil's already winning some battles in some of our lives. Because some of us sitting in this room haven't grown spiritually for a long time. And it's not that you're the devil. It's saying the devil is messing with you. He's got you so focused on work, so focused on career, so focused on this, so focused on your kids' extracurricular activities. Marcus said it great. He said there's only a 0.027% chance of your kids ever making it to a professional level. There's 100% chance they'll stand before God. Yeah. Yeah. I love that my kids love sports. I love sports. Still love sports. Still watch the Chiefs game. I ran but my... my, my uh, Redheaded daughter ran a cross country meet, and I said, "Your you're gonna your goal, your only goal is to PR today. That's a personal record. Get your fastest time." And you know her race was three miles, and I know I ran a mile and a half. I'm like, "You better not!" I was running right down. I didn't realize that I could have got her disqualified for pacing. I didn't even know I was pacing. I was pacing. <laughs> I'm running from like like because they just, just did this windy thing. And I'm running down the line. You better run, girl. You better run like somebody's chasing you. Come on, you chicken thoroughbred. Let's go. So, uh, that's what I call her. So, my thoroughbred chicken right there. Anyways, so I'm, I'm, I'm running up and down the line, you know, and I'm like, you better run. And, I, you know, and so the thing is, I'm just, I'm that parent. Yeah, I'm that parent. Now, I don't yell at other people for winning, and I don't re yell at referees. I yell, you know, I'm like, I want to be my, I want my kids to know that I cheer. But I want, you know what I want my daughter to know more than I love, and I'm proud of her for running hard? I want my daughter to see me love God most of all. That is the most important thing in my life, is that they know how much I love Jesus. My desire is that my girls will find boys that love Jesus more than them. Then they'll find somebody worthy to date. And you know what? My girls haven't found yet. yet. That's hard to find. That's hard to find. Boys, I'm telling you, you'll get an absolute no from me unless I think you love Jesus more. I'm like, mm -mm. You want to go hunting? We're going to go about a mile and a half deep into the woods. There's a hole there. A lot of animals find their place. All right, sorry, distraction. Squirrel. I've learned something about squirrels. If you can get a pack of squirrels, it's called a scurry. Come on. For those trivia people last night, 
We did not get that right, but I was like, that's my favorite moment. I'm in a scurry. We're in a scurry. All right, sorry, sorry. Okay, so. All right, so. <laughs> all right, now, for the teaching of today, in Matthew chapter 6, and then I, we've, we've, we've really covered a lot of ground already, um, but I want you to see this. So as we're looking at this, and, and we're looking and we're talking about these, these, um, these, these tactics that the devil loves to do in our life, we come back to Matthew 6, 13. It says, and lead us not into temptation. We've already talked about that. But deliver us from the evil one, right? Not just from evil, from the evil one. Deliver me from the devil. Guys, the devil is real. Not a figment of imagination. He's an angel who was kicked out of heaven. And he took a whole lot of angels with him. And they're called demons. Not a figment, not made up. They're real. They hate you and they want to destroy you. His, his purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. So the, what I want you to see is when we look at this and deliver us from the evil one, the word deliver in Greek, rume, it is to rescue or deliver. Pretty simple. But here's what's really amazing. Deliver in Greek is middle voice. Something about the middle voice, this just changes everything when we read this. Because sometimes we just read it and like, okay, but this will just take you somewhere. Middle voice means the one under attack, that's us, deliver me, right? That's us praying it. And the one being prayed to, God, so there's two parts in this prayer. The one doing the praying and the one being prayed to, right? The middle voice means that we're both taking action in this. We're both taking action. Sometimes what we do is say, well, I just do nothing and God does everything. That's not actually what this is saying. It's saying that you're going to do something and God's going to do something. So the deliverance from the evil one is not just from God or it would be passive voice. If I was doing everything and God did nothing, it would be active voice. So what does this mean? Well, for starters... We pray. That's, the, that's where it starts. We pray. Okay? We pray. That's what this model teaching, this model prayer is teaching us. But is there anything else? Or do we just kind of sit back and do nothing? What if? What if God has already given you all the weapons that you need for the victory that you so desperately want? What if it's already, what if it's already there? Let me, let me explain something. If I gave my, my cell phone, it's a smartphone, to my grandma, she could do two things with it. She could make a phone call and she could use it as a paperweight. My grandma doesn't know how to text, not to be mean to my grandma, and she doesn't want to. She doesn't know that that keeps my calendar. It sends reminders. It's my alarm clock. I mean, that thing does all kinds of things. It's also got my, all my Bible stuff. Somebody's like, hey, I'm on the road. And somebody's like, hey, what's this Greek word mean? Boom, I'm on it. I don't have to bring my computer everywhere. I can bring my phone. It's all on my phone as well. So the thing is, a lot of times you have everything that you need and you don't even know it. Till the day. Yeah, come on now. Till the day. So take notes. All right, so. I want you to understand that deliverance is already available. When the evil one, it's already available right here, right now. So the first thing that I want to do, whoops, I, I, I forgot to do the slide. God has already given us everything we need for victory. First thing is this, boom. First thing, Ephesians chapter 6, we know this. I know that the words down here, it says God has given us the armor of God. That's the first thing that, you, that, that God has already given you. If you are saved, right, if you have received the Holy Spirit into your life, one thing you already have right now, you have access to the armor of God. And it says this, therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when, not if, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. He doesn't say charge, he says stand. When the devil comes, I'm standing still. When you come, I'm standing and if you knock me down, I'm going to stand right back up. In wrestling, I only knew one move from the bottom. Stand up. That's all I did. And then they would trip me and I'd fall on my face. 
and I'd stand back up. And I would stand up over and over and over until they got tired of tripping me. I wasn't very uh, graceful at it. I didn't ever even try another move. That's the only thing I was like, coach, he's like, try this, try the, the Grammy roll, try this, try this. And I'm like, coach, there's no one that weighs the same amount of weight on this planet that can keep me from standing up. I'm going to stand up. And at some point, he's either going to clasp me and I'm going to get a free point or I'm breaking free. It may take a little bit of time and I may fall down a few times, but I am not stopping. See, that's what this is all about, right? He's like, so when the day of evil comes, you just stand, stand. So then he goes on and he says, well, after you've done everything, stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth. You have the truth. If you have the truth, the truth sets you free from all the lies and deceit the devil comes. So you put that puppy on. These kids don't understand belts today because their pants are down here. But all of us adults in this room should know you put it on to keep your pants on. That belt is the truth. When you know the truth, the truth sets you free. So put the belt of truth on. Then he says the breastplate of righteousness. That is being right with God and doing right. If I'm living in sin and I'm following the ways of hell, it's pretty hard to have my heart protected, isn't it? But when you're chasing after God, you start having your heart protected because you're doing righteous by Him, through Him, and Him through you. Talks about having the shoes of peace. We talked about peace in Sunday school. Pastor Daryl did a great job talking about peace. Then he talks about having a helmet of salvation. You know, one of the things is whatever happens in my life, one of the things, you know, Barbara and I a long time ago went bankrupt. We lost everything we had. And, and not that I'm saying that because I'm proud of it at all. It was a very embarrassing time of my life a long time ago. And so we were going through this and we we're like, how are we going to pay these bills? How are we going to do this thing? How are we going to do this thing? And I said, you know what? At the end of the day, I can tell you one, I can tell you a couple of things. They can't take my salvation. They can't take your salvation. So we're good there. They can take our home. They can take our car. They can take our rainbow vacuum. <laughs> they can take my motorcycle. They did. They can take my truck. They did. They can take my house. They did. But at the end of the day, we're going to be to, we're going to be together. Ba baby Malachi was a little baby then. He said. And you know, here's the deal. We're not going to be homeless. Never is somebody that belongs to the family of God ever going to be homeless. Never. You may not have a home that's called your own, but you got a couch. I got a couch. Got several couches. We got couches everywhere. So, so he says, helmet of salvation. Then he talks about a shield of faith. The shield of faith is, is to extinguish all of the fiery darts of the evil one. And then he talks about a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon that's here. And it's how you defeat him. When he says a lie to you, you defeat it with the truth, the Word of God. Where do you put your, what do you put your sword in? What's it called? Where's that located? What do you put the sheath on? On your belt. And what's your belt? The belt of truth. Come on, somebody. Come on, right? So, so he gives us the full armor of God. If you don't put it on, that's not your fault. I mean, that's not, your, that's not God's fault that you're getting trapped up into lies, is it? If you don't put it on, you don't put that puppy on. You don't suit. My wife, my wife all the time says, if the shoe fits, lace that puppy up and wear it. Okay. It's not God's fault if you won't put on the armor that he's given you. See, God's already given us everything. Let me tell you the second thing that God has given us. God's given us authority. His authority, not me. I didn't have it. God has all authority. He's given us authority. I guess I probably should catch up with my notes. In Luke chapter 10, I love this, the 70 returned, right? So they came back and, um, and, and they were like, wow, even, even demons... We're subject to us. 
when we, we use your name, we could drive out demons, right? And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority. I give you authority. I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but rather rejoice because your name's written in heaven. Isn't that awesome? But here's the thing. God's already given you the authority. You, if you are saved and Jesus is in you, he has all authority in heaven on earth. That's already in you. He's already given you all the authority you need to win that fight. When the Bible says in James 4, 7, submit yourselves into God, resist the devil, and he'll flee to you, you have the authority to send him back to hell where he came from. Devil, you take your lie and you go back to hell in the name of Jesus. That's what you do. When he starts lying to you, tell him to take that lie and go back to hell. The problem is, is that we don't do that. We entertain it. We're listening to it. We're taking it in and then we're believing it. And then we wonder why we're living defeated lives. One of the lies that he loves to tell you is that everyone's out against you. Nobody loves you. Everybody hates you. You might as well go eat some worms, right? You see, the devil's got all kinds of lies. He has all kinds of fears that if he can live you, get you to live in fear and get you to live in, in the lies, he's already won. Resist him. Last one I'm going to show you today. Actually, not another one after this it was the last one on the page God has given us his divine power to demolish strongholds in 2 Corinthians it says the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world on the contrary they have divine power the weapons we fight with what What do we fight with guys what do, what's the weapon we fight with the sword of the spirit already given to us that's what we fight with so the weapons we fight with have divine God power we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. Anything the devil says, you have the power, divine power from God to kill it. That lie is not coming into this head. You do not win today. And we take captive every thought. How many times have you allowed a thought to come into your mind? A negative thought about somebody else. And you let it live there all day long. Come on. Come on. How many times have we done that, right? You get worked up, right? We get worked up. We took offense at something. Somebody hurt our feelings. Somebody said something. Guess what? People do that. You do it too. So the thing is, is that what we find is that over and over and over, we keep, we keep letting the devil put these thoughts in our head, and then we dwell on it, and then we're ready to go throw a grenade in somebody's house. And we're like, I'm burning everything down. Like, calm down. Are we sure that the devil hasn't been planting some negative thoughts in your head and you're just doing Well, guess what? Take that puppy captive and make it obedient to God's word. Whatever happened to thinking the best of people? That's one of the things that our worship minister says all the things. Think the best of people. Don't automatically, man, we make so many assumptions. Almost every problem that I ever, it ever comes to me, I'm like, well, there's about three assumptions made there, and they don't know actually the truth. Well, guess what? When you don't know the truth, it can't save, set you free. Because it's the truth that sets you free. So, last one. God has given us his wisdom and discernment to understand the times. And what I mean is this, is that when the devil comes, and he brings things into your life, and he says things, he does things, you can seek God's wisdom to know if it's of the devil or of God. Because if he's a masquerading as an angel of light, we may want to know, God, is this from you or is this from him? Before I act. Sometimes we act and then ask God, was that you? Oh, man, I made a mistake. If any of you lacks wisdom, James chapter 1 he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave 
of sea blown and tossed by the wind. A person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. God's given us His wisdom when we ask. See, you have everything that you need. Deliverance is already there. God has already secured the victory. The devil has already lost. The only thing that the devil can do in your life is to get you to lose with him. That's it. That's all he can do. He's already lost. He lost when Jesus rose from the dead. He lost. He lost! So quit following a loser! Quit listening to the loser! So then I, I have this huge question that I, I want to end with. Well, hold on. I, I want to say this. I, I highlighted it so I wouldn't forget and I almost forgot. <laughs> God has already given you the tools for victory. Not just, not just that. He's also going to be with you. Not only is He going to be with you, but He's going to supernaturally wield the divine tools He's already given you. Follow me here. It's kind of like this. when you, I remember the first time I ever took Malachi fishing. I casted that out there and that and his bobber went down and he was super little and so we grabbed it and he couldn't quite hold on and so I am got my arms around him and I we're holding it back and it's just going everywhere and, and I put his little hand on there and we just reeled this in together and we pulled this up on the bank in the same way God's got his arms around you and when you grab that sword and though your hand is shaking he puts his arms around you when the devil is looking at you. He doesn't see you. He sees the Father. Nobody messes with my dad. When you resist the devil with your words, he doesn't hear you. He hears Jesus. You see what I'm saying is this. Jesus has got his arms wrapped right around me. And when I say, devil, you go back to hell from where you came in the name of Jesus. He's repeating every word with me. It's his authority that we're using. And when you trample on that serpent's head, he doesn't feel your foot. He feels the foot of Jesus. Jesus is in me. His authority, everything that he is, I asked him to come into me, and he did. So why is it so important to have this victory? It's how the prayer ends. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What kind of a message does it send when I let the devil just stomp me into the ground, what kind of a message does it send to a believer in the king of kings if I'm just laying on the ground and the devil just kicking me and kicking me and I have no fight in me? What message does that send when I just keep following the lies of the devil? When I keep living in fear, what message does it send? So here's what we do, believers. We stand up in victory because God's already won. He's already won the fat battle. He's already won the battle in your mind. So stand in it. Stand in it. So when we, when we pray and we're seeking God's victory, it's not for my kingdom, it's for His kingdom. And we're doing it with His power. And it's for His glory. That's why. So I want the worship team to come up. And we're gonna, they're going to sing a song here. I asked this morning if they would do this for me. This song is called...